so today we're really excited to have Dr. Brenner join us and share his insights. And if you'll join me in giving him a round of applause. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. Today, I'm going to challenge your ideas about uh, the future of behavioral health to think about what business thinking we can bring into behavioral health. I think much of the work that we've been doing in Camden has really been starting to bring in business thinking to primary care. So I'm a, a family doc. I've been working in one of America's poorest cities in the country, Camden, New Jersey. It's right across the water from Philadelphia. It's nine square miles, the first, second, or third most dangerous city in the country, and the first, second, or third most um, uh, poor city in the country as well. The issue that we've been struggling with in Camden is thinking about the most complex sickest patients. And these were always the patients in my primary care office that I was the most fascinated by. These are, in Camden, 1% of the patients, which are responsible for 30% of the costs. And in America, we have these patients everywhere. If you looked at your employee population within your organization, a small percentage of the dependents are responsible for much of the costs. It doesn't matter wh which data set that you look at in healthcare, but a small percentage of people are responsible for much of the spending. This turns out to be true in almost every human system that you look at. It's called a Pareto curve. It's the 80-20 rule, if you will. So if you go to your children or your grandchildren's school with any classroom, there are a small number of kids in every classroom that are driving much of the discipline. If you look at the principal's office, there are a few families that are coming back over and over. Those kids and those families, those kids have a different learning style than the rest of the, the kids in the classroom. They need a different kind of school and a different kind of classroom and a different kind of teaching style. Within any city, there are a few uh, residents of the city that are driving much of the violent crime in that city. And Bratton's innovation in the New York City Police Department was figuring out how to pivot day by day to the patterns of crime to make sure that the police department was responding to the outliers. And that's essentially what I'll be talking a lot about today, are who are our outliers? And you all are experts in our outliers. Our outliers have severe behavioral health and addiction issues. They're way out in the long tail of our data sets. And by and large, our biostatisticians ignore them. They want to take that long, messy part of the data set and just cut it off. That biostats and epi is often about our averages and our means, but it's not dealing with the super complex patients. And our systems, whether it be education, criminal justice, or healthcare, marches along and deals with the average patient in a moderate way, but we don't deal with the outliers. And in healthcare, many, many of you or your family will end up as outliers at some point. And our system's just not built to deal well with the outliers. We can pull the outliers back from the brink of death. We can hook them up to a ventilator. We can transplant their organs. If they're Siamese twins, we can cut them apart. But what we haven't caught up with is that complexity that in the American healthcare system, we've spent over $50 billion on the National Institutes of Health on research. Starting with the Hill-Burton Act, we funded our hospitals and built a huge inpatient medical hospital infrastructure. We've spent a fortune through Medicare and Medicaid, through DISH money, through GME money, educating a medical industrial complex, creating an incredible medical industrial complex. And the next great innovation in healthcare is going to be catching up with that complexity. It's going to be thinking about the how of healthcare, not just the what, not just the med, not just the procedure, but how do we put all that stuff together and create a highly organized, highly structured delivery system. The problem that we're facing right now is an incredible crisis. We have 85 million baby boomers in the midst of retirement the largest demographic bubble that our country's ever seen. And in fact, it's not just America. All of the industrialized countries in the world are facing this insane, incredible bolus, and this incredible um, uh, part of our population that's aging all at once. We've never in the history of the world had so many people live so long. That's incredible success, but we have no idea what to do with that. So the bulk of the long-term federal debt in America is healthcare, healthcare, and healthcare. It's not Social Security. 
We have leveled out on our healthcare sp expenses in the last few years, but as soon as we come out of the recession and the baby boomers retirement accelerates, we're gonna pick up in the cost of our healthcare system. 10,000 people turn 65 every day, and we have no idea how to deliver organized care to every single one of them. And I would argue that many of you hold the lock and hold the key to beginning to figure this out. You guys are the best kept secret in the American healthcare system because you've been through all this. You know what it looks like to deindustrialize or to deinstitutionalize a healthcare delivery model. You know what it looks like to close inpatient hospitals. You know what it looks like when we don't build a system to catch all of these patients. At one point, inpatient psychiatric hospitals were one third of state budgets. And because of advocacy, because of patients and their families and many of you saying enough is enough, the system isn't working, we began to deinstitutionalize psychiatric care. And you guys have worked so hard in the last 30, 40 years with very little resources to begin to build a system on the outside to catch all of these patients. My colleagues on the medical side have no idea what's in store for them. We have no idea what deinstitutionalization looks like and we're about to experience it because there is no way that we're ever going to bend the cost curve in healthcare without deinstitutionalizing medical care, without building a system of community-based care, without rebalancing our system away from extreme acute care out to a more community-based model, without reacquainting ourselves with the, uh, the mind-body principle, without understanding what's really driving healthcare. That's the journey that I've been on, and that's the journey that I want to share with you today. But I want to do this in a way that brings business thinking to the problem, because I, I think that the biggest mistakes over in healthcare is that we have been uh, very widespread adopters of technology, but the most important technology we've bypassed. The most important technology is not the gizmo and the gadget. It's not the new procedure or the new scanner. It's the basic way people do things. It's the language with the, that we use, the way we talk to one, one another, the way we organize our work. That will be the most powerful technology in healthcare, and we've only begun on that journey. You guys are way ahead of us. You know what teams are. You know what team-based models really are. You know what it means to rebalance hierarchies. I've been at behavioral health conferences where half the audience are patients. I've been up on deuses where I shared speak event, events with patients. The medical side knows none of that. They've never heard of those ideas. So I want to start out with um, the punchline, which is, um, you know, the, the title of the talk is, is it really possible to deliver lower cost um, and improve quality in healthcare? And I want to give you the punchline. The answer is yes. And the answer is popping up in the most out of the way places, that the fountain of youth has been discovered in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. And every single one of you, when I get done, is gonna to clamor to make sure that your mother or your grandmother has this. And it's a net-enabled, bioengineered, high technology, very complicated nurse <laughs> that visits elderly patients with complex medical issues every week or every other week and delivers a highly structured, highly reliable intervention every day, every time they go to visit. There are no accidents here. It takes nine months to be trained into the model. This is a focused factory. So many of you, when I say factory, think of something that's inhumane and cruel. But I'm gonna argue and I'm gonna convince you by the end of this talk that every single one of you wanna go back to your organization and build a factory. Because a factory in modern terms is highly reliable, it's highly structured. You have a clear goal, a clear purpose, and you achieve that purpose. You measure that purpose and you know that you're accomplishing it. You don't tolerate defects, you don't tolerate variation. That's very hard to do in healthcare because of the variability of people coming to us. So this was a study that started about almost 12 years ago that looked at 1,700 adults over 65. And in this highly structured model of a nurse visiting every other day, or every other week, or every week, they randomized the patients into a perfect randomized control trial. 
one group of patients got the nurse coming out to visit them, and the other group of patients got just default American healthcare, right? The best healthcare system in the world. That's what they got. And it turned out that they had a 25% lower risk of death if they had the nurse going out to visit them in this highly structured intervention. Now, let me tell you what you have to do to lower the relative risk of death by 25%. I have nothing that I can give you or your family. I have no medicine I can prescribe that comes close to this. When your doctor measures your blood pressure, treats your blood pressure, treats your diabetes, treats your heart disease, they drop your risk of death by a few percentage points. That's what you're clamoring for. That's what we're paying 18% of our economy for, is to drop the death rate by a few percentage points. You have to go back to AZT, treatment for AIDS. You have to go back to iron lungs. You have to go back to penicillin to find any treatment that could lower the death rate by this much. This is a stunning accomplishment that you've never heard of, that was never in the newspaper, that was never widely touted in the media. What was most interesting is the highest risk patients, these are 80 year olds with three chronic illnesses, had a 48% reduction in the death rate. That's a stunning accomplishment. Cut the death rate in half for 80 year olds with three chronic illnesses. What's most interesting is that in the 10 year period of the study, the benefit of having a nurse come out and visit your mother or your grandmother doesn't go away. It's a continuous benefit over the entire period of time. What's most frightening is that they had a 33% reduction in hospitalization and a 22% reduction in cost of Medicare for the highest risk subgroup. The middle subgroup they broke even on, the highest risk subgroup, this would be enough to close every hospital in the country. This is the blockbuster video moment for the American healthcare system. This is the Kodak moment. Kodak was sitting on the technology for digital film. There was an inventor at Kodak that figured out how to make digital cameras and create the whole ecosystem of digital film. And they told him to sit on it and didn't let the technology out. And Kodak is now bankrupt. They're a penny stock. And they had to sell off their digital patents in order to get out of bankruptcy. So the, the fountain of youth in Doylestown is just a nurse going out to visit your mother or grandmother and a highly structured intervention. What's most interesting, and you can ask Don Berwick about it tomorrow, is that in the midst of the Affordable Care Act of $10 billion in spending in Medicare to innovate, we have an innovation center, they pull the plug on this, that the poor lonely soul sitting in the corner at CMS running a demo project had long been forgotten. And in the middle of pushing all this money out to innovation, they actually pulled the plug on this. They got within one day, they had actually told all the patients that they were disenrolling them from the Medicare demo. And they were about to close down the entire thing. And an article in the newspaper was the only thing that saved it. That political pressure in the end was the only thing that saved it. And I wanna pull this story apart and I wanna pull this intervention apart and think about what it can teach us over in behavioral health and primary care about what we need to do going forward. This is an incredibly powerful story. So the first lesson is that we don't have even a language for population health. Population health as a word is being bandied around and I would argue that it's a meaningless word right now because if you ask 20 different people, they'll give you 20 different definitions. And one small example of that is that we have meaningless words like care management. So let's think about what care management, what, about what that word means. It can stretch from the idea of a Medicaid managed care nurse in a cubicle calling homeless people with no phones in Camden, New Jersey, <laughs> all the way over to our intervention, a lot like your ACT interventions or PACE, which is a real nurse, a real social worker, a real community health worker, talking to real people in person, building relationships, banging on doors, doing the messy work of actually delivering care. And to think that we have one word that we use right now, care management, to stretch across all of that, that's a meaningless word. It doesn't fundamentally mean anything at this point. We have another meaningless word called hospital medication reconciliation. So my staff have pictures of of piles of medications that we found in many, many different patients' homes. 
And one bag of medication that we found is worth $50,000 of the local hospitals in starting and stopping all the different meds. When you get to the point that hospitals are doing something with a checklist that's called medic medication reconciliation, but then when you go to the patient's home and you pull open all the drawers and all the cabinets and you find every medicine bottle they've ever been prescribed for the last 20 years, you've given yourself a false sense of confidence because that checklist in that hospital, that extra bundle of work in the hospital really was meaningless because you didn't get to the house and pull open all the meds and all the drawers. So population health is filled with all of these ambiguous terms that don't mean anything. When I say physics to you, the physics bus in the room know that if I drop a stone, I can calculate how long it's gonna to take to hit the ground. I can calculate the speed of light. When I say population health, we don't have any of the same kind of rules of thumb. We don't really know what we're doing yet. So population health for me is better care at lower cost for everyone every day. Better care at lower cost for everyone every day. But everyone every day doesn't need the same thing. So the first step in population health is segmentation. And we're gonna talk a lot about segmentation today. Everyone uh, doesn't need the same thing, but also once you get people into buckets and you categorize them, the same person doesn't need the same thing every day either. So that gets into a new set of words called surveillance of systems that are responsive moment by moment to the individual needs of the different categories of clients. We're terrible at this th thing in healthcare as well. If we did what Procter & Gamble did, we'd go out of business. You know, we don't segment our marketplace. We don't surveil our marketplace. We don't understand our customer. We don't deliver to our customers a highly reliable product that they can count on every day. And that's the task, I think, going forward. What we've learned in Camden is that to do that, you need three things. You need data in ways that we don't normally use data. And I'm going to talk a lot about that today. You need redesign, which is box by box redesign of workflows. It's the factory. It's Six Sigma. This is very specific and reliable delegation, protocolization, standardization. That's the thing that our artists amongst us recoil at. This is what family doctors say. I don't practice assembly line medicine. Get the bean counters out of my office. I'm an artist and I know what I'm doing. Don't impinge on my clinical autonomy. Leave me alone. You have people in your organizations that respond the same way. There are artists and they rebel against the idea that anyone could redesign what they do, that anyone could standardize and protocolize and structure what they do. And the third piece of this is engagement. And it's probably why I'm most enamored by behavioral health, because you guys have nailed this. This is motivational interviewing. This is dialectical behavioral therapy. This is trauma-informed care. Over on the community side, this is community organizing. In business terms, this is change management. All of these models of communication are incredibly facilitative. They break down hierarchy. They fundamentally rethink the language that you use to talk to people. This is harm reduction, and we don't know how to do this on the medical side. Our model of engagement goes like this. Mrs. Rodriguez, do you know how many times you've come in here with uh, diabetic foot ulcers and sugars in the 600s? You must be cheating on your diet. You're not taking your medicines. You're non-compliant. If you don't listen to what I say, we're gonna to have to cut your feet off. That's the model of engagement that I was taught. <laughs> That's the model of engagement that I watched my mentors use with patients. Fear. We use that all over the place in healthcare. You guys figured it out, right? Fear doesn't work, especially to traumatize and damaged patients. Fear doesn't work. So for the data, the folks in the room that hate data, we're gonna do a little segue on data. And my goal is to convince the people in the room that hate data, that turn off when someone shows them an Excel spreadsheet, that uh, how important this is. So this is a map of the city of Camden. This is five years of data in the city of Camden. And I'm gonna share with you a failure story. I heard a speaker today talk about the importance of failure stories, and I can't agree more. We don't have a Latin term for the study of failure, and it's far more important than the study of success. So I'm gonna share with you my failure story. 
So this is a map of Camden with five years of claims data on it from all three local hospitals. And we overlaid the payments to the hospitals on this map. And we asked a simple question, do expensive people in America live together? Are there patterns that we can use in the data to find them? And if we find them, are there strategies that we can build to deal with their problems? So this is uh, the red areas on the map, nine square miles, are 6% of the city blocks, 10% of the land mass, 18% of the patients, 27% of the visits, and 37% of the costs. So that means that in only 6% of the geography, more than a third of the spending is going on, that patients are being collected into buildings in Camden. These are the two most expensive buildings in the city of Camden. The first building has 600 patients with 12 million in payments for their care over five years. The building at the bottom is 300 patients with 15 million in payments for their care over five years. The building at the top are full of dual eligibles. These are patients who were poor and disabled with Medicaid and Medicare. It's a beautiful building, great management. Building at the bottom is a subacute rehab and nursing home. Also a beautiful building with elderly, disabled, retired patients who are older than the building at the top. So I said to my staff a couple of years ago when we found this, I don't care how much money you spend. Let's figure out how to bend the cost curve in Northgate 2. This is an incredible opportunity. We found the most expensive building in the poorest city in the country, and we're going to bend the cost curve here, because if we can't do it in one building, we'll never do it at the community level. And I said to him, do everything you've ever thought of. We pulled out all of our tools out of our public health, our social determinants tool set. We did the Stanford chronic disease model on the first floor. We did diabetic classes. We did uh, yoga. We did art therapy. We did group therapy. I hired a psychologist to sit on the first floor and do group therapy with the residents in the building. We had community organizers come in and organize people. I couldn't think of anything else to do. We did exercise classes on the first floor, anything we could think of. We opened a two exam room primary care office on the first floor. But then two years later, we got a hold of all the billing data from the city. So we've got 10 years of billing data. We've got the list of everyone who lives in the building. And we also match that to all the claims data from the two exam room primary care office to find out did we make a difference in hospital and emergency room utilization, which was really our goal at the time, which was to reduce cost. And we made no difference. And let me show you why. I made a classic error that I'll bet you make all the time and public health makes all the time as well. And Procter and Gamble would never make this mistake. So this is called segmentation. Segmentation is data voodoo. Segmentation is where you take nonlinear methodologies and linear methodologies and you put people in buckets. And then you look at each bucket and you say, does our hypothesis about the world match up to what we've guessed about the world? And then you move all the buckets around in ways that you're not supposed to touch data doing. A biostatistician would hate segmentation. So these are the four buckets that we found in the building. There are people in blue who rarely visit the hospital. There are people in yellow who are medium emergency room utilizers. They have on average two to three ER visits a year. In the red are high emergency room utilizers. On average, they have eight emergency room visits and one inpatient visit. And in the purple are high inpatient utilizers. On average, they have three inpatient visits and one emergency room visit. So let's see how they break out in the building. This is the breakdown of the whole building. And what you see way over on the right side in the red and the purple are the people who are going to the hospital. The vast majority of one of the most expensive buildings in the poorest city in the country never go to the emergency room or hospital. All of the utilization in a very sick building of dual eligibles is concentrated in a very small segment of patients. Do you think they come down to a yoga class? <laughs> Do you think they're enrolling in the Stanford model? Do you think they're laying out their soul in our group therapy visits? Do you think they were doing yoga? Were they doing art therapy? They're shut-ins. You could have told me this, right? They have very poor social networks. They don't build trusting relationships. 
They're isolated. They're locked in their rooms. They just go back and forth from the hospital, actually to Abigail, to the nursing home I showed you, and then back to Northgate too. They just go around and around like that. They're not joiners. If they were joiners, they would have never ended up so complicated and sick. They're very different people. They have extraordinarily high levels of early life trauma is what we've learned about them. You could have told me this. We didn't have the tools or the understanding to even begin to understand what we were doing. We didn't segment the marketplace. We didn't know our customer. We didn't understand the drivers of what was going on. So let me show you more segmentation. This is hard to read. Let me describe it to you. And I know all the data people, non-data people in the room are saying, no, no, more data. Please stop. But, but stick with me here. So this is called a crosstab. It's the simplest thing you can do with data. And this is the entire data set for the city of Camden in one year. This is everyone who went to the hospital emergency room. And on the left side is broken up the ED visits. And on the top is breaking up the inpatient visits. And the way you read this is way down at the right-hand corner, 62 people had five or more inpatient visits. And in the same year, they got treated and released from the emergency room 10 or more times. So think about what it's like to be an emergency room doc in Camden. It's a terrifying place to be. Just chaos rolling in at every moment. You're always behind. You're running from room to room to room. There's only two solu three solutions to each problem. They die, they get discharged, or they go upstairs. That's your three levers to pull to get them out of the bed and keep your flow moving along. So this is telling you the 62 people who were sick enough to get admitted five or more times upstairs didn't scare them 10 or more times, and they got treated and released. They're a very different group than the folks over on the left side. 339 people never got admitted. That means they rolled the dice 10 or more times and never got sent upstairs. They got uh, treated and released from the emergency room 10 or more times. So those, that segment, that 339 group, they're younger, they're more drug addicted, they've got more pain, addiction, they have real medical issues, but they're not sick and tired of being sick and tired yet. They're much, much harder to change. They have very high rates of personality disorders. It takes a very specific intervention to tackle that group. Very different than the group over on the far right, the 62 people who've been treated and released 10 or more, five or more times from the inpatient setting, they're older, they're a little bit more over the hump, they're a little bit more ready to change, they've got much more severe chronic illness, they're starting to fall apart. If you show it up at the bedside, they're much more likely to change, they're more ready to engage. If you look down, uh, way over on the left side, up at the top left-hand corner, 26,000 people went once, 13,000 people went two or more times. So all over the country, we're hiring really nice social workers, and we're putting them in emergency rooms to do ER diversion. Statistically, what does that mean? That means that most of the people you're gonna to talk to only come back once that year. It's a waste of a resource. Procter & Gamble would never do that. They would know precisely who they were targeting, what segment they were targeting. They would understand the psychology, the sociology, the ethnography in intense detail they would have tested the intervention and they'd know exactly what they were doing and whatever product they were selling to that group would be built in a highly reliable factory where they would tolerate very few errors. That's what we need to do in healthcare. That's what we need to do going forward. That's not what we're doing. We've got a jumble of people in a jumble of buckets with a jumble of interventions. You're way ahead of my medical colleagues you've at least got some tiers of how you tier people. Sometimes they get stuck in the buckets. You know, also, there's still a schism that I've begun to realize between addiction and behavioral health, the mental health care, that you still have to figure out how to join those two fields. So let's talk about the cost in each of these buckets. Over on the far right in the red are inpatient overutilizers. There are 500 inpatient overutilizers in Camden. And the whole population, 79,000 people, the top 1% of inpatient overutilizers, it's only 500 of them. On average, every time they go to the hospital, it's $10,000. Over on the ER side, every ER visit's only 1,000. If you want to save money, focus on the inpatient 
overutilizers. They had 2,000 inpatient visits. They had 4,000 emergency room visits. Their spending was $10 million in inpatient costs and 1.7 million in ER costs. If I give you a million dollars, which would be 10% of spend, and said, build me a project for 500 people, I bet many of you in this room could do that. It would look like an ACT team. You could do your ratios, you could do your staff ratios, you could make your business model, your performing, you could figure that out. Now, if I said over here, I want you to build me a program for ER overutilizers over in the dark blue, there are 5,000 emergency room overutilizers, 9% of the total population in Camden. They had 28,000 emergency room visits. They have 11 million in spend for their emergency room visits. If I gave you a million dollars, it would be really hard to build a program for 5,000 people. You would get stymied. That's a system failure. Those numbers are so large that you'd have to get into primary care offices and start shifting the delivery system. That's why this data is so important. Unfortunately, this data is really hard to get because getting this data is a little bit like getting the data from Target, Walmart, and Kmart, combining it all together in your community and trying to get rid of their customers, right? That's very, very hard to do. Hospitals don't want to give up this data. I would argue that this data is a public resource that should be accessible to people that want to solve this problem. We often segment these data sets by disease. And what you do in, in the American healthcare system is we bucket people by disease. Diabetics in a bucket, heart failure patients in a bucket. Then we build our inter interventions for each of those buckets. And the problem with each of those buckets is that a severe diabetic has nothing in common with a well-controlled diabetic. They were born in a different family. They live in a different neighborhood. They have different sociology, different ethnography. And, Procter & Gamble would never try and sell them the same product. They even have probably different genetics, different biochemistry to the disease underlying it. We, we bucket them all out as ICD-9 code 250 point something something. We send them all to endocrinologists. We really have no idea what we're doing. And, and interestingly, the severe version of all the diseases actually look a lot like one another. They share comorbidities. They have the same chaotic family structures and they have lots and lots of early life trauma for which the interventions on the medical side probably do more damage than we help them. So we would argue in, in Camden with these data sets that disease should be a secondary or tertiary segmentation that you should segment by complexity first. So this is looking at all inpatient high utilizers, the top 1%, which we broke down to 215 patients, looking at where they live and then the diseases that they have, which is very different than how the American healthcare system does this. We've looked geographically all over the country. We have a sister organization in Trenton, in Newark, in many locations around the country. We've looked at their data sets. And high cost complex patients everywhere in the country cluster into buildings. They're all enrolled in your programs. Now, not every schizophrenic is a high cost patient and not every high cost patient has mental health and addiction. That's the problem with these data sets. So these data sets can help you segment, but it's not, these things are correlated. They're all, not all gonna be deterministic. This is a map from a rural community. We mapped out three counties in Maine, and there are patterns in Maine as well. Even, if, even in a rural state, complex high cost patients get collected up into town centers. And the state of Maine wouldn't let us show you it, but many of these patients live in group homes. They live in, they are domiciled in many instances. So this slide is because I want to convince you that the work that I'm up here talking about is not the work of poverty, that this is the work of repairing the fractures and fragmentation in the American healthcare system. This is an abnormal CAT scan of a middle-class woman with a master's degree who went repeatedly to a five-hospital, highly integrated system connected by EPIC. And she went back over and over to the emergency room, over and over to the hospital. She went 102 times to the emergency room, 54 times she was admitted. She had 147 CAT scans and 73 CAT scans of the head. That's enough CAT scans to reduce, uh, to increase your lifetime risk of 
of cancer because of the exposure to radiation. And a group of family medicine residents who were hotspotting, looking for outliers, teamed up and found her case, got to know her, pulled a psychologist into the team who went out and did home visits and found out that she had extraordinary anxiety. And the, the anxiety was what was really prompting her to go back over and over. As she began to get her anxiety under control, she stopped going to the emergency room, stopped going to the hospital, and began to feel much better. So the story of, of, of our work in Camden is not the story of poverty. It's very much the story of integrating behavioral health, addiction, housing, other services back into medical care. I want to share one patient story with you to give you an idea of the kind of patients that we work with. This is a 55-year-old male admitted for GI bleed and shortness of breath. This is a dual eligible patient living in a high rise. Patient has Medicaid and Medicare is disabled. In six months, had nine emergency room visits and six inpatient visits on 12 meds a day. Has end stage renal disease, kidney cancer, hep B, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, blockages in his arteries, asthma, glaucoma, sleep apnea, and severe back pain. This is the crazy things that our teams have to deal with on a routine basis. So this is the patient in the middle, and these are all the different services that touch this one patient. This is just like the patients that you are dealing with in your programs. It's a bewildering array of services erected around these patients. The patient was picked up by our team, would go right to the bedside, same, same couple of days they're admitted, and, and enroll them. We follow them out of the hospital, go to their home, go with them to their primary care appointments, with them to their specialty appointments. We wrap around them for 90 days. Sound familiar? So this is the ACT team model brought over into the medical side. This is PACE brought over to the medical side. The patient got uh, discharged to subacute rehab, readmitted to hospital number two, and we needed to coordinate home nursing, PT and OT, transport, meals, durable medical goods, dialysis, nephrology, transplant. The poor primary care provider in a 15-minute visit had to coordinate ophthalmology, pain management, GI, cardiology, urology, oncology, and surgery. There's not an electronic health record system in the country that's going to solve this problem. There's not a, an HIE that's going to solve this. There's not an, a federal funding model that's going to solve this. This is the American healthcare system. This is what happens for 50 years. If you overspend and overinvest in the biomedical model, you get this. Incredible success. This is the consequences of the unbelievable success of the biomedical century. But now we need to catch up with all the complexity that we've created, because none of these circles know how to play nice. They're actually not trained to do it. My colleagues on the medical side have no idea how to work in a team. For them, a team are just people that you tell what to do. <laughs> we don't know how to delegate. We hold on to work. We don't know how to break down hierarchy. We don't even know how to communicate in a non-hierarchical way. In fact, if we started playing nice, we'd all go out of business. All our laws prevent the kind of data sharing that you'd need to do to really solve this. And right now, our data sharing models overwhelm people. We have a metadata problem of too much data in a lot of HIEs. There's no way that you can sit down and look at all of the data generated from this. We don't know how to put this into a way for people to even view and begin to use. We're so far away from solving this problem. But you guys are years ahead of this. You've begun to solve this. You have collaborative models. You have team-based models. You know how to organize teams in ways on the medical side. We don't even know, how, we don't even have a language for doing this. These are the crazy piles of medicines that I mentioned you find in people's homes. And this is the patient. His name is Glenn. And Glenn has since passed away from his kidney cancer, but he gave us permission to share his story with you. The real hero here is Corinne in the middle. And Corinne is an AmeriCorps volunteer with a college degree who spent a year with us as a health coach out in the field. She reminds me of the frontline folks that you guys use in your, in your ACT teams, right? College degree will get you a lot in this work. And we delegate tons and tons of work to our health coaches, but they need close supervision. They need lots of structure in order to do this. So the person on the right is a nurse, Jason Torrey, who does lots and lots of coaching, mentoring, and training with our AmeriCorps volunteers. And on the left is her primary care provider. And we won her primary care provider over in one way. 
which is we get him out of the room quicker. We make his life easier. These folks are overwhelming. These patients are so challenging. They shut our day down. They back us up. They're the reason we get home late if we're a good provider because you know, we, we can't do their care in 15 minutes and do a decent job. This is the kind of data that we use day by day by day. This is a list of every day who's been admitted to all the local hospitals. Our organization is a membership nonprofit where I've got unruly members on our board. Three hospitals that are fighting over market share, except my market share. <laughs> Two FQHCs, behavioral health, addiction, long-term care, and we re-elect our board, re-elect our executive committee, and re-elect our officers every year. My goal is to get them to all play nice, collaborate, share data, to work with the top 1%, the sickest and most complex patients, for which they're losing money on, which has been the real trick of this work. So we run a health information exchange as well, where we get real-time data and call that real-time data to track and spot our patients and go right to their bedside to enroll them. So I want to close by posing the question around why is saving money so hard in healthcare? It's really, really hard. So the first reason is that I think this is an existential moment for our healthcare partners. You need to walk out of here and have empathy for the largest, most domineering hospital system in your community if you want to work with them. You need to understand that that CEO goes to work every day not knowing whether that board's going to sack them, not knowing where they're going to make it to the end of the year, terrified that they're going to have to have layoffs, cutbacks, and they perceive that their margins are thin. And I know that you all feel that same way. They have watched many of their colleagues get taken down. The average tenure of a hospital CEO is very, very short. And they're going to conferences right now, and the consultants are telling them that their fixed costs are so overinflated, they're going to have to figure out how to bleed 20% of their fixed costs. Otherwise, they're not going to be left standing. That they're playing a giant game of musical chairs right now, and there won't be enough chairs for all of them. This is an existential crisis that happens in our society. We're really good at letting things go out of business. It's a blockbuster video moment. There had to have been a moment in the corporate leadership when a young executive came up and said, people are renting videos online, and the, the leadership didn't do anything about it. They were sitting on property all over the country. They were flying high. They were incredibly profitable. Same thing happened in the steel industry. Same thing happened to Kodak. This story of American capitalism is we eventually let things go out of business. Many hospitals have already gone out of business in the history of America. Many more are left to go out of business. We're going to have massive consolidation in the hospital industry, like nothing you've ever seen. And your pension funds, your family's pension funds, your state funds are tied up in hospital bonds all over the country. We have inflated a massive and unnecessary and expensive infrastructure that we simply can't afford. And we're going to have to pop the bubble. And when you pop bubbles that are 18% of the economy, it's not pretty. It's very ugly. This is a major source of jobs in many urban communities. There's no way in Philadelphia, my community, that five hospitals with five med schools are going to be left standing when all this is done. It's a very hard moment. The other problem that we have to tackle on the medical side, which you got forced on you by patients, by patient advocacy organizations, is the hierarchy in the medical system. And the hierarchy is so extreme, and it's represented by the salaries of doctors. On the left are orthopedic salaries, 400,000 a year. And on the right are pediatric and HIV docs, family docs, making 170, 180,000 a year. Now forget about the absolute number. What this represents is extraordinary differentiations of power, money, and influence. On the East Coast where I am, the doctors who get the board seats, the doctors who are always up in the C-suite wielding influence, the doctors that get the C-level jobs, all came up through these higher salary, more lucrative specialties. So uh, in Philadelphia, it's so extreme that our orthopedic groups, our high-end folks on the left, are making a million dollars a year. Can you imagine telling someone making a million dollars a year that they might be doing something wrong? 
that they need to collaborate in a team-based model. They need to listen to their employees making 50,000 a year. It's just not gonna happen. That's an extraordinary level of hierarchy. You know, they're not gonna understand the models that you guys are using. They're not gonna grapple with behavioral health. So this is a very hard system to unravel. And there's no way that you can make a million dollars a year and not do unnecessary things to people that hurt them and don't help them. So this is a very overwrought system that's gonna take a long time to break down and may suddenly break down at some point. The professional group in America, that's the largest group in the top 1% of income, is not entrepreneurs, it's not Wall Street, it's not bankers, it's physicians. The largest group in the top 1% of income in America are physicians. And it's not all physicians, it's physicians that do procedures on people. They're not interested in behavioral health. We're really far away from beginning to shift that. We're to the point now that when a cardiologist walks in and talks to your mother or talks to your family, that conversation is a loss leader. They lose money from talking to your family member. The only way they make any money is writing a script for an echo, a stress test, getting you into the bed or getting you into the scanner. That's a huge indictment of the American healthcare system. That's a capacity bubble of extraordinary size that's gonna be very difficult to pop and a hierarchy bubble that's gonna be, um, it's gonna block the ability to redesign how these models work. If you're an ACO, the folks on the left go from being your power centers and your rainmakers to being your cost center and your liability. The folks over on the right go from being your feeders to being your leaders. And people don't know how to do that. This is a huge struggle inside the American healthcare system right now. I'm sure everyone in the room knows about the ACE study, right? ACE study, raise your hand. So I go to the medical conferences and I go to hospital conferences and there's like one lone soul in the room. It's like the poor person who worked up into like being the, um, the head of social work in the hospital. It's like the only person in the whole hospital has ever heard of the ACE study. You know, we need to ask why is, you know, how can you be an ACO? So the, the interesting thing about Folletti's original paper, what he has to tell us is that the best predictor of medical spending of healthcare utilization is your level of adverse childhood experiences. You know, the best predictor of obesity, substance abuse, smoking, of poorly controlled chronic illness is adverse childhood experiences. How the hell are we running around all over the country building accountable care organizations, building predictive models, when we have no idea even about this literature? I mean, it's sort of an indictment, once again, of the American healthcare system. And the question we need to ask is, I'm a family doc. In family medicine, I actually worked with a psychologist and a psychiatrist in my residency. I never learned about the ACE study. I didn't learn about the ACE study until deep into practicing in Camden. When I learned about it, I stopped in my tracks. I said, holy shit. It's like malpractice. It's like I've been practicing without knowing germ theory. You know, this is a transformative framework between the stress hypothesis rolled into the adverse childhood experiences. We need to turn this into a vital sign in primary care. We need to figure out how to dumb this down to the point that you can do it in a 15 minute visit and deal with it. And that's my challenge partly to all of you is to figure out how people like me can turn this into a vital sign in primary care and turn this into something that people can do. Because we don't have enough money and time to send every traumatized patient to a psychologist who's specialized in co-occurring disorders, who's specialized in early life trauma. You know, that's like sending every diabetic to an endocrinologist. There's not enough endocrinologists to be able to do that. The other problem we're having in healthcare is that we keep having this terrible fight. And you have this as well. There are two sides of every table in every meeting you have. And one side of the table are all the effective people. And they're relationship-centric. And they love building relationships with patients. They form the most profound bonds with families and they get lost in those bonds. And they show up to meetings late, and they're kind of frustrating because they turn things in late, and they don't, they're, not, 
you know, the trains aren't running on time in their world. It's okay, they'll, they'll get there when they're, when they're ready to come to the meeting. The other group are your efficient people. Those are your operational people. They need to pay the bills. They need to worry about the ratio of staff to patients. You know, they're worried about everyone showing, and they're so frustrated when all of you show up at the meeting late. And they're taking really rock solid minutes and they're pulling the minutes apart. And, you know, and somehow your effective people, your relationship centric people, need to figure out how to get along with your operational people. And where something breaks through is when it does both well. I would argue ACT is both effective and efficient. PACE is both effective and efficient. The nurse family partnership is both effective and efficient. Ryan White clinics are often both effective and efficient. That's because they're focused factories, highly structured interventions with clear roles and responsibilities focused on one segment of need. And that's the sort of puzzle I think that we need to figure out. So I'm gonna close with one final slide. And this is my, my plea to all of you to go home and build factories. You didn't think you were gonna come and see me ask you to go home and build a factory. So this is a slide looking at the progression of the auto industry. And way over on the left, if you wanted to buy a car in the early, the late 1800s, early 1900s, you would go to an artisan studio filled with master craftsmen making the most amazing work of art you've ever seen. And those cars would be incredibly expensive. Very few of you in the room would ever be able to afford one. The parts weren't interchangeable. They were not easy to repair. Henry Ford came along and stretched all that out. One day you were the world's most amazing craftsperson. Next minute you're just putting tires on all day long. Very boring, repetitive work. But their wages went up. Every member, every employee in the assembly line could now afford a car. But they were all black, they were boring, they were identical, but they now had interchangeable parts. An ecosystem emerged to repair them. That was because of standardization, protocolization, task shifting, specialization. Modern, the modern assembly line, you have to be college educated to work on it. You need to know exactly what you're doing. The engineers are coming down asking you questions. A lot of the most boring work has been automated. The technology is an enabler to help with human processes that have been built and figured out. It's not the technology in front of the people. It's the human process that's been changed. The most important technology was specialization and really was industrialization. So the three most inefficient, ineffective fields in our economy are healthcare, education, and criminal justice. And I think all of us need to figure out how to industrialize healthcare. And you guys are further ahead on the continuum than a lot of us. You've already had to wrestle with some questions of segmentation. You may not have realized it. You've already had to wrestle with specialization, task shifting, with driving down costs. You're, you're further along in this industrialization of healthcare than we are, and you need to help us figure it out. So let me stop there. I think that's a great stopping point, and I think we have a little bit of time for questions. I think that there are microphones in the middle, is what they told me. Yeah. So the question was about the patient-centered medical home. I wish it worked, but it doesn't. So the... The Patient Center Medical Home was originally designed by pediatricians back in the 60s and 70s. Then in the, in the, uh, around the early 2000s, all of the specialty societies for primary care, pediatricians, internists, and family medicine came together and came up with principles of the Patient Center Medical Home. And then from that, the NCQA ran off and created a certification model. The problem is that we ran off and certified something that we had no understanding of. We ran off and certified it too quickly. It's not that the principles don't work, it's that we still have no idea what we're doing. The how of the patient's medical home is more important than the what. It's really a change management problem. And what we're doing is shoving way too many good ideas down the throat of these primary care offices that are already failing, underperforming organizations 
where people are running from room to room to room doing meaningless 10-minute encounters that don't add up to anything. Often the manager in a primary care office was really good at the front desk and got promoted up to being the manager. That does not set you up to implement EHR. It doesn't set you up for meaningful use, for NCQA, any of that kind of change management stuff. So I think our primary care model in America is totally obsolete. It's underperforming, and it needs something much, much, much bigger. If we, you know, in our Camden model, rather than doing NCQA certification, all I want primary care doctors to do is wake up every week and focus on the five people who were recently hospitalized. If that's all they did, they would save money. Whereas a lot of patients in medical homes are driving up cost, they're not driving down cost. It's not to say that it's a bad idea or everyone is failing. I'm just worried that we rushed the idea out of the lab and we're distracting people. If I had a primary care doc's attention, I would just want them to focus on their sickest and most complex patients. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, I'd like here. to build on the comment and question you just answered. Um, we spend five to seven percent of the healthcare spend in this country on primary care, and the reason why docs are running, you know, seven to ten minute visits is because these clinics are ridiculous, shamelessly underfunded. And and I think the future is actually in virtual and physical one-stop health and wellness centers that address the social determinants of health, housing, education, as well as medical care and behavioral health, and pushing substantially more of the healthcare dollar into those centers. Do you think I'm on the wrong track? So I don't disagree with anything you said. There's a wonderful book called The Healthcare Paradox, which essentially says that if you compare America to all the other industrialized countries, we underspend on social services and we overspend on medical services so that we're medicalizing social problems. So underlying the premise of your question is really that point, which is that um, so much of this is about social correlates. I'm not gonna say social determinants, social correlates. It's about housing, it's about education and other things. But I would argue that 95% um, uh, of what I did as a primary care doc in my office could have been delegated to an RN level nurse and maybe even a health coach, 95%. The only things that you and your family need me to do are three things. Diagnosis for unusual things. You need me to deal with um, where the protocol goes off the tracks, where there's an unusual complication. And the third one is comorbidities, where I now need to prioritize which treatment we're gonna use in the face of comorbidities. Everything else should be delegated. What I should have said to you is, you know, Mrs. Rodriguez, you have high blood pressure. And let me introduce you to Rita. Rita is the most amazing nurse in the world. She's an RN who I've trained and we've worked together to figure out how to start and titrate your blood pressure medicine. She's gonna come out and check on you. She knows exactly what to do and if there's any problem, she's gonna call me back. And for the next six weeks, you're gonna be working with her in a very intense way to get your blood pressure under control and then I'm gonna see you back. And you know, a lot of what I'm doing is wasting my time doing stuff that should be delegated. If we did that, we could create a factory in primary care that would be much lower cost and much more delegated. There's a model for this. There's two wonderful models. One is the Scholdeis Clinic in Canada that does, is a focused factory for hernia repair. And the other is a focused factory in India called the Ayurved Institute for uh, cataract surgery. And someone here in this room or someone somewhere is gonna need to figure out the focused factory for primary care. And that's R&D. That's gonna take a, a lot of complex thinking to figure it out. So I think there's... Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm one of those professionally trained clinical social workers who's done all of this in outpatient home health-based services with visiting their services, having worked in some of the top teaching hospitals in the United States. So my question to you is, and I believe people, docs and all, need to get out of the boardroom. And I'm a big fan of community-based services. Yours is fine, but don't forget to include us social workers because we're there. But what do you think, and you talk about chronic chronically ill patients. So I'm not gonna ask this question, I'm just gonna, I have a question, I'll preface it by saying, we need to start having a discussion about death and dying. We're not gonna be living forever, and we need to have this healthy discussion when family members say, oh no, I'm not the one at the DNR or what have you. But what impact of the ACA will have on Medicare and Medicaid and on and the exchanges? 
and I know the docs, you know, I know the hierarchy and <laughs> surgeons at the top, psychiatrists at the bottom, and I, you know, you don't want to work together because I've worked at Hopkins and, John, and Mass General. So what impact is the ACA going to have on providing this kind of care and the exchanges and train professionals, be they docs, psychologists, or social workers, or whomever, and the costs? This is a 30-year problem. There's no way that the Affordable Care Act could fix a problem that's been 100 years in the making. So I've seen dialogues begin to occur amongst my professional colleagues that I never thought I'd see, and amongst hospital administrators as well. So the Affordable Care Act started the conversation, and we've had this conversation about every 15 years. We had this conversation during the Clinton reform era. We had this conversation in the 70s with rate setting and the advent of HMOs. We have this conversation over and over whenever we go through a recession. So um, Affordable Care Act's not going to fix this. I think what's going to happen is the costs of the baby boomers retiring are going to not enable us to financially boom our way out of the conversation. It's going to force the point, finally. Um, the response to your early part around, uh, around uh, death and dying, um, are you proposing death panels? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing you. I think... <laughs> Yep. You're going to. She, um, you're going to put us all out of business. What are we going to do? Twenty-five percent. Twenty-five percent of New Jersey residents go through the ICU on the way to dying, and you want to get rid of all. That's the best lucrative part of the hospital. You want to get rid of that. Um, so I just want to check in. I think we're, we're all done. And uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it.